have uh, Michelle uh, Cavagilli, and part of the reason we're here is because his efforts and Stephen's efforts to apply uh, and obtain uh, grant funding so we can, they can do on-farm research and research at their facility and then um, we can bring that information here to, to you. So Michelle is a, a soil scientist at USDA Ag uh, Research Services in Beltsville, the Agriculture Research Center. He is the lead scientist on long-term cropping systems, uh, working with trials, working with organics, comparing organic and unconventional. In 1985, he was an intern at the Land uh, Institute in Kansas. He has varying degrees. He has uh, biology, soils, and ecology, and he wants you to know that he gardens organically. I'll, in, I'll introduce Stephen Mursky after I do my little section. We decided to split our talk into two parts, and as Jenny mentioned, uh, we're going to talk about on-farm research that was supported by a grant from NEFA, National Institute of Food and Agriculture, part of the USDA program. Uh, specifically the organic research extension and initiative portion of that. And as Jenny mentioned, that grant not only supplies the uh, support for doing the on-farm research, but also to help support this conference and some other conferences, and also to support the development of an e-organic community of practice for uh, organic grain crops. There's a table out there with Betty Moreau's, who's uh, womaning the table, who can explain more about the e-organic program which is something we're just getting off the, uh, That's your point. we're just getting started on that. So we are open to input on what kind of information we should be putting out on a web-based information uh, uh, platform. And I'm real happy, I should mention, uh, real happy that Jenny has uh, kept this program going. She, I think it's her fifth or sixth year that she's been working on it. And seventh, holy camoly, all getting older. Um, which has been just a wonderful way for us to uh, tell people what we're doing and in addition to that has been the way that we've met a lot of the farmers that we're now working with. So it's been really important for us as a way to get ourselves out on the landscape and learn from what farmers are doing. And one thing that we've learned, well everybody knows in this area that nutrient management is an issue in this part of the country. We have the Chesapeake Bay, I'm not going to even dwell on that because folks know about that. Farmers, a lot of them need to have some nutrient management plans and there's a state level program for incentives for cover crops to help control nutrient runoff. However, there's little known about what are the best management practices for nutrient management in organic systems. The, in terms of principles, we have a good idea what the principles are. We know how to, that we need to look at cover crops and manure and crop rotations. We know those things, but there's not much quantitative data on what you specifically need to do in different sites, different soil types, different crop rotations. What's the best way to manage your nutrients? And so we spoke with uh, farmers that we met again through this conference primarily, and through Jenny and Luke Harwood and other people that we, I met on the shore uh, probably close to 10 years ago now. And we developed concepts, uh, trying to develop, learn from them what the issues are and then develop research programs that could work on their farms so that we can be in place uh, to do this research. And I'm hoping, can you guys see that? We did black, we had, we had a debate on whether we should do black or white. It looked better with black on our computer screens, it might look better with white. I'm not going to change it, so I'll tell you what it says. So the concerns that we heard from our farmers that we spoke to are that if you're using manure to get your nitrogen needs for crops, you're going to build up your soil phosphorus levels and you might get up too high at some point. So how can you get as much nitrogen from non-manure sources that don't bring in the phosphorus at the same time? And so that leads quickly to managing legume cover crops and how to best integrate those into a cropping system. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a little bit of academic stuff. Uh, and I'll try to keep an eye out in case you have questions or need clarification. Uh, but I think a lot of this stuff you guys are probably already familiar with, but I want to put this in context. And I'm going to bring Steve, Dr. Stephen Marsky is going to come up and talk about the data that we collected as a group. I don't know if you noticed there were a lot of people from Boyk here based on Jenny's clicky thing. A lot of that is because the people that have done a lot of this work are here, making sure we're telling the story correctly, I guess. <laughs> but we have photos of them, so. 
Um, so on an organic farm, of course, you don't have access to nitrogen fertilizers. So wh what are you going to use as your, as your sources of nitrogen? The crops still need nitrogen, right? And a lot of times people will point to legumes and animal manures as your primary sources. But we have to remember that an important source is soil itself. And Jeff, I think, did a really good job of kind of outlining the importance of soil. And that becomes especially important in organic systems. Of course, soil nitrogen, you can't really see it, right? It's difficult to predict how much is going to be available to a given crop. And it, the amount that's available is very variable based on environmental conditions. Largely soil temperature, soil moisture, change, things change very, fit, very quickly. Sometimes the nitrogen released from the soil is not in synchrony with the crop uptake. So you need to factor that in. So then the question is, well, on any given form, any given location, how much nitrogen is released? And this is the standard answer. Nick Maravell, an organic farmer from the, that other state out on the other side of the uh, Chesapeake Bay, west, Western Maryland, um, he likes to say, whenever you ask a, a scientist a question, the answer is always, it depends. And that's what I'm going to tell you. It, and it does depend, because whether and that, this comes back to uh, Jenny's clicky thing, too, is that the number one reason for challenges in organic farming, or farming in general, was, was weather, right? Well, one of the reasons that that's a challenge, besides the fact that crops need the, the, the water from the lane, but another important reason is that soil moisture and temperature have a large impact of release of nitrogen from soils, release of nitrogen from manure, release of nitrogen from legumes. So that in organic systems, you don't really have that readily available nitrogen that you can place right there when you need it, as conventional guys will do with something like a side glass nitrogen fertilizer. But what often you find, as Jeff also showed, and we find in our long-term plots as well, is that often you have a lot more nitrogen reserves in your soil because of how you've historically managed your soil. And so that's one of the challenges when you're converting to an organic system is you need to spend time building that reserve up. And then it's not just the amount of, of nitrogen you have, but it's also the quality of that nitrogen. <clears throat> so I have a data slide next to show from our long-term study in uh, Beltsville, Maryland, just showing two of our systems. And I'm comparing here a conventional no-till system and, a convention and an organic system, both the same rotations, corn, soybean, wheat, and then a legume. And this is after 16 years. What we did is we, plant, we planted corn in the rotation when it would normally happen, we would normally plant it, but instead of doing our usual management where we add nitrogen of different sources, we added no nitrogen for a certain portion of the plot. So th these data are for those portions of the plot with no new nitrogen this year. It, this was done in 2009. Uh, by John Spargo, who I should mention, he was the postdoc on this project, did a lot of the coordination. This wouldn't have happened without him, as well as a lot of other people. So what did we find? So this is corn grain yield, no nitrogen added in 2009, and then we just <clears throat> measured the corn yield at the end of the year. We did actually hand weed these so that we could see just not the impact of the weeds, but just the impact of how much nitrogen's in the soil on corn yield. Well, you see the numbers over there, right? This is no-till organic. This is really the best that conventional can provide in terms of building up soil organic matter reserves and nitrogen. And this is organic. So we're getting 47 more bushels in that one year. Granted, this is just one year, but shows pretty good. This is replicated data. Those are statistically significant. I didn't put the little letters, even though that's what I want to do because I'm a scientist. So what we're seeing is that there's a big difference in yield, and that's based on the differences in nitrogen fertilization. I mean, nitrogen reserves built up over time is what I meant to say. If we look at the total amount of nitrogen in the soil, this is pounds per acre. That's quite a bit of nitrogen, right? That's a lot more than you would apply in any fertilizer for any crop anywhere, at least 10 times as much. That's a lot of nitrogen, but that's in a form that's largely unavailable to plants. It's the organic nitrogen that organic farmers talk about. The other thing you notice is that th there's actually no statistical difference between these two when you do the, the statistics. So it looks like there might be a little more in the organic system, but it's really about the same. What does that tell you? That tells you that that pool of nitrogen, if you measure the total nitrogen, that does not tell you how much is going to be released and available to the corn crop. Instead, what we need to do is some more complicated analyses where we put soil in a jar and we let it release the nitrogen slowly over time. <clears throat> and we did this for like uh, 
or close to 300 days, and you measure how much nitrogen is released. And this is one way of getting a sense of how much nitrogen is available. <clears throat> so when we did that, we find that there's quite a bit of release in the no-till in the conventional system, but there's even more, more of that in the organic system. And we've done other tests that I didn't put up on here that show that we have quite a bit more nitrogen that is released in a year in the organic system. And that's the goal of organic. So I just want to, I'm, I'm spending quite a bit of time on this because I think this part is, is harder to see. You know, you don't see the legume growing, you don't see the manure being applied. But this is an important part of how any kind of sustainable system really is going to operate. Who can see that? Oh, great. <laughs> a few. <laughs> the, next group, the next category is legumes, just from that first slide. And I can, you can see the, the nice pictures of uh, crimson clover on the top and hairy vetch on the bottom. These are important uh, cover crops used in, in various places of the country on organic farms. And the question again is how much nitrogen do you get? And guess what the answer is? Anybody know? It depends. Depends on the species, the cultivar, your, your, how, the weather during that year when you grew that cover crop, how much nitrogen it was able to pull out of the atmosphere, how big the plant got. So then it depends on your termination date, if the plant was large when you killed it. So it depends on a lot of things. Manure, how much nitrogen do you get from manure? What's the answer? It depends. And Probably more farmers on the eastern shore use manure than legume cover crops, so you probably know a lot of these issues. There's inconsistent nutrient content in manure. If you place it in the soil, you're going to keep most of your nitrogen. If you put it on top of the soil, they're going to lose a lot of your nitrogen through volatilization. So those are some of the things it depends on. The release rate, again, is similar to the soil. It's not clear, it's not always clear how it's going to be released relative to the uptake by the crop. Cost and availability vary for different sources of manures or byproducts. Uh, feather meal is an option for some organic farmers on this side of the uh, bay. And of course, as I mentioned before, you're going to build up soil phosphorus if you apply manure solely over a long period of time as your nitrogen source. Um, I'm just gonna, so what's critical then is to test your manure prior to applying it, both for nitrogen amounts and phosphorus amount, so that you can keep an account of how much nitrogen phosphorus you're putting on your, in your system. Hopefully you can see that one. Raise your hand if you can see it. Okay, good, good. This one's a little more important, it's got numbers on it. If you have a soil that is testing high in phosphorus, I don't know all the regs in Maryland, some of you probably know them better than I do, but in some cases you can only apply as much phosphorus on your field in, the form, in whatever form as you're going to take off in the crop grain. So this table that uh, John Spargo made for us shows a rotation of corn, soybean, wheat with these yields. And if you have these yields and you take off this much phosphorus P2, in the form of P205 per bushel, then this is how much phosphorus you're going to take off per acre. So in a three-year rotation, you're going to take off 134 pounds per acre of P205. So what does that mean? That means you can only put that much phosphorus on in that rotation during three years. What if you're using manure as your nitrogen source? Well, poultry litter, a real common source of manure on this side of the bay, is 50 pounds of P205 per ton. So how many tons can you put on in three years? You can put on a little less than three, 2.7 tons to match what you're taking off. So where are you going to put that in your rotation? You're not going to put on your soybeans because you don't need the nitrogen on the soybeans. But three tons is not enough to provide enough nitrogen for your corn and your wheat in that rotation, right? So you need to think about sources other than manure. Um, I'm going to skip over this, I think, because I, th I think we need to move forward. This has to do with the synchrony of nitrogen availability. But one thing that we found, and this is from more work done by John Sporgo, is looking at side dressing some of these manure sources. And on this bottom bar, this is poultry litter, pelletized poultry litter, pelletized poultry litter feather meal blend, and this is feather meal. So these are potential sources of nitrogen. 
And all of them come with phosphorus except for the feather meal. The dark ball is, at, is applied at planting and the light ball is applied at side dress. And what this graph shows overall is that on average we get a 17 bushel per acre increase in yield by side dressing this year. So that was interesting to us because manure is generally applied at planting. So this opened up an avenue for uh, being able to apply possibly less manure by applying it at the time when the corn can take it up the best. So this led us to putting it all together, put all this together. There's a lot of it depends in those slides, right? So our question is, well, what happens when we do this actually on a farm with farmer input, with farmer management, and work with them closely to figure out what combination of legumes and manures works best for their system and their crop rotation. And I'm gonna, uh, within the, so the goal of the research then is, how can we maximize nitrogen inputs from legumes and supplement with animal manures close to the crop phosphorus removal rate. So we're looking to apply as little manure as possible, really, and get as much nitrogen from our cover, legume cover crops as possible. Uh, we established these plots in 2010, and so we're going to show you some data from 2011. And real quickly, these are the locations where we did the research. Three sites on the eastern shore, and I'll let Stephen, he's going to describe more of these uh, these locations. We also have a research site at Boyk. We're not going to present those data today, just to focus on the Eastern Shore data. And uh, with that, I'm going to introduce Stephen. Uh, Dr. Stephen Marski has a PhD in something, I don't know what, from Penn State. <laughs> Stephen has worked a lot with cover crops. He's worked with cover crops both in tilled organic systems, in conventional systems, and now he's doing a fair amount of work in reduced tillage organic systems. He knows something about soils, he knows something about crops, he knows something about weeds also, I think. Is that right? He told me not to mention weeds. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce the farmers that we worked with. I think most of them are in the room. I don't, I don't think I saw Ed here today. I don't know if he's here, but uh, Bill Mason and Aaron Cooper are in the room and, and their subsequent uh, uh, team of, of, of uh, in their operation. And so here's uh, Mason Heritage Farm. Uh, Queen Anne County, Mar uh, in Mar it's Queen Anne in Maryland, Eastern Shore, 850 acres of crops, mostly grain. Uh, he's got 15 acres of fresh market vegetables uh, in some irrigation, and, and there's a reason I mentioned that. That'll stand out in some of the results we see today. Uh, direct market produce through farmers markets as well, and that sounds like that that's expanding, as uh, I heard today. Uh, and he's transitioned 190 acres uh, starting in 2005, and I think that total number is, is, is ever increasing. There's 500, I think, and 50 acres now certified today. And Bill's also been doing a fair amount of work uh, in the last couple of years uh, with no -till, uh, organic no-till soybeans, and has had uh, a lot of success in that area as well. A typical rotation on his farm is a, a corn-soybean rotation, two cover crops in between, so rye prior to soybeans and the crimson clover uh, before the corn. Uh, he also uses poultry litter. And, and some of the issues that we talked about uh, with uh, Bill and on his farm is that his soil phosphorus has increased substantially since using a lot of poultry litter, and, that, and that's a concern, uh, especially uh, highlighting some of the things that Michelle talked about earlier. Uh, Fair Hills Farm. Uh, so Ed and uh, Marion uh, Fry in Chestertown, Maryland, uh, conventional milking herd of 250 cows. Uh, they've got uh, 420 acres of organic forage and grain production. Uh, and I, I just recently learned that uh, they received the award, uh, the Patrick Madden Award for Sustainable Agriculture by SARE, 2006. And they have a, a, a six-year rotation of uh, that's typical of uh, triticale kale prior to corn, soybeans, wheat, and then a three years alfalfa crop. And also nutrient management issues are, are a concern and the buildup of, of excess of phosphorus. And then uh, the other uh, farm that we've been working with, Cut Fresh Organics, uh, Aaron's here today. Uh, and this, uh, he farms that land with his father at, at Eden, Maryland. This is 700 acres, uh, 780 acres of conventional soybeans, corn and small grains. And also he has a, a vegetable operation that's been growing and does a, a, a number of different uh, commodities there and, and is starting to do some rotations with vegetables and grains. 
and he's been converting quite a few acres uh, over the years. I think it's somewhere around uh, 200 acres that are in transition right now, or, or 300, or 100 right now. Okay, so we got that number incorrect. And, and again, similar concerns. Uh, as you can see, the, the, the concerns about phosphorus loading up on, on a site and, and excessive use of, of poultry litter. So this, this project that we got funded was to address some of these concerns. We've been interacting with uh, uh, these growers for a, a number of years, have attended various uh, different uh, uh, advisory meetings as well as uh, uh, breakfasts on the Eastern Shore and, and, and then at field days where we've been having these discussions. And this is what catalyzed the, this particular grant proposal that funded this work. And uh, what I wanted to first just show you is, is what this looks like, uh, this, the field trial. This is uh, on station at Bark. So this is at our location in uh, Maryland where uh, we have the full factorial of, of this experiment. And, and on the farm, there's various uh, versions of this factorial. So here is the full experiment. Uh, and it's laid out. So these are just different replications, rep one, two, three, and four of the, of the same set of treatments. And, and split plot design is just a, a way of describing how we structured the experiment, but essentially it's got four replications. Uh, here, this design you can see, these different colors represent different cover crop treatments. Uh, and I'm going to go into greater detail about that. Uh, and, and, and the growers that we were working with had subsets of this where they were uh, looking at three combinations. So here uh, in, in purple or blue, depending on how that's coming across, uh, these are where the four reps lay out for hairy vetch. So that was the cover crop established in the fall. Uh, we seeded that at 30 pounds per acre. And here are a number based on some, some of our work and literature values estimating that about 150 pounds per acre of nitrogen uh, coming from that, that cover crop. Uh, and, and so uh, when we look at the, this plot map and just kind of work our way around it here, you can see now in the green, this is Austrian peas. And uh, here we see this at 100 pounds per acre and about 110 pounds uh, per acre of potential nitrogen fixing ability. And here in our red, crimson clover. And here's our no cover crop treatment in the yellow. So we have four cover crop treatments and three of those are uh, uh, a legume and one of them is a no cover crop. And then to introduce uh, the perennial system, so before we were looking at just the annual cropping system, and now we're looking at the, the perennial cropping system, kind of uh, uh, working with uh, Ed in his six-year rotation. And so here we have three manipulations of the alfalfa to create those treatments and four poultry uh, litter treatments, and it's replicated four times. And, and so I think I've, I've confused the schematic here where we have uh, four manipulations, that's not accurate. So in the case of the, 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 the dark green here, we killed the alfalfa in its third year of growth uh, in the fall and planted rye. And this was to try to drive down the available nitrogen in those fields and simulate our no cover crop treatment that's in the annual cropping system. Alfalfa produces a lot of nitrogen reserves in the soil. And as you saw by the earlier uh, part of this talk, there's a lot of potential uh, uh, mineral nitrogen that's coming as, those, as that builds up in, in the soil. And so there is a, a lot more nitrogen coming out of the alfalfa uh, crop. And so we wanted to drive that down in the fall and simulate a no uh, cover crop treatment. And then we have two alfalfa manipulations. So one where the first cutting is plowed down in the spring. So instead of taking that cutting, harvesting it, and, and using that as a forage, uh, we use that as a cover crop for the corn in the following season in that spring. And there the potential fixing ability is 190 pounds per acre. And then the third treatment, here it's harvested for forage. So the, the roots are intact. All of the uh, nutrient reserves that are in the root below ground biomass is intact. But now we've removed the above ground in the form of forage. So how, what is the advantage of, of that, that additional cutting in the, that fourth year of the uh, alfalfa? And so we're interested in, in, in two questions here. We're, we're, we're interested in this nitrogen response and the yield potential 
So there we want to look at how this system is behaving in the absence of weeds, right? Because weeds take up nitrogen, weeds compete with crops, they compete for light. And, and so we wanted to look at that in the absence of weeds. So this is our weed-free portion of our plots, and you can see that's 15 feet long, and uh, I think it's 20 feet wide. And here we went out and hand-weeded three times throughout the season. So there was the standard management that uh, the grower uh, would undergo in their corn operation, and that typically was anywhere from two to three rotary hoeings and, and two to three between row cultivations. Uh, but on top of that, then we came in three times throughout the season and eliminated any of the weeds that were growing. And then on the other side, because we know that, that weeds are a component of the system, we want to take that systems approach. So we're looking at how weeds are interacting. And so there, that's just standard management on the standard weed control, but without this additional uh, coming in and thinning out the weeds in the field. So to break down those four fertility treatments that I had mentioned uh, earlier, we have uh, two treatments at pre-plant. So here we put down poultry litter at the nit nitrogen-based rate and then the phosphorus removal-based rate. And if you remember before, that that was about three uh, tons uh, per three years. And so we were talking about a one and a half tons of, of uh, poultry litter in this, uh, for that treatment and uh, uh, three tons for the nitrogen-based. And here we have a side dress treatment. So now we're putting down the phosphorus-based uh, rates at, uh, the, at side dress. And since we don't ha have uh, uh, the equipment uh, to do that uh, on farm right now, you can see how we put down our side dress applications. And that was a, that was a big hit for all of the people on the crew, spreading poultry litter for, for days. And you can see the little bags here where we were putting them out either at uh, side dress here or pre-plant right before the cover crop was terminated. And the last one being the control, so no poultry litter whatsoever. And this is what that, that looks like. So you were looking across and you saw these different cover crops here. Well, within that cover crop, these different hash marks represent the no litter, the pre-plant litter at the nitrogen rate, the pre-plant at the phosphorus rate, and then the uh, side dress application. And here are just some pictures of, of some of the other metrics that we take in the field, removing biomass uh, for uh, analyzing how much nitrogen is coming from the cover crop and how much biomass it produced. Um, here we are, for example, uh, when we're coming out to collect the data. Uh, and so in, in order to get this information on farm, we have to come out and hand harvest all, all of our, our samples. And so we're interested in how much nitrogen is taken up in the whole corn plant when it reaches physiological maturity. So we come in with our machetes and we cut down 10 foot a row. And we we uh, package it up here and then we bring it out and weigh it and subsequently take subsamples and grind it up and analyze it. And here are some just more photos highlighting what we do at our, our uh, on farm during these harvest days and, and hand pulling off all the ears that we'll analyze later. Okay, let's look at some of the data. So here uh, um, are the three farms that we're looking at. So Mason Heritage Farm, Cut Fresh Organics, and Fair Hill Farm. Remember these two are the annual cropping system and this one has, is the perennial based cropping system. And we're looking at cover crop biomass in pounds per acre. And uh, uh, some of the, the differences that we're seeing here, the Austrian pea reached about 3,000 pounds per acre, and that uh, was planted after uh, the, the, the previous crop was taken off, whereas the uh, cereal rye crimson clover was aerial seeded. So you got a lot more biomass because it was established a lot earlier, and it had a lot more time to grow. Uh, the cut fresh organics, uh, site here had Austrian peas and hairy vetch. So let's remember to highlight the difference. They both had Austrian peas. One was cereal rye, crimson clover. The other was hairy vetch. And they were pretty comparable in their, in their biomass production on farm. And then the Fair Hill site, this is how much alfalfa was produced uh, from that, that first cutting in the spring. And then that rye that was established in the previous fall where we had uh, uh, plowed up the alfalfa, that's how much biomass we got out of the cereal rye. Now, here's a picture of the, uh, here, uh, give you a sense of what's going on for weed biomass on the three different farms, so in the same format, but now we're looking at the, the three, four bars that you see here are no poultry litter, N-based poultry litter, P-based, and no poultry litter, so that same uh, order. And uh, I, the reason why I inflated the scale here, we're all the way up at 1,200 pounds, was to give a, a sense of perspective. 
I think that we're working with farmers that are too good at managing their weeds. And so we didn't get much of a weed response because they had really good weed control. Uh, uh, weeds that are really starting to impact uh, cr crop performance really starts to happen when you get above this threshold, 600, 800. We commonly try to keep our weed management below 1,000 to give you a sense of, of uh, perspective. So the weed management was really good across the board. Uh, so there were some minor variations in, uh, amongst the treatments, but by and large, the control was about the same and these bars that you see here those are error bars so they just they show how much the data uh, varies and so by and large there wasn't huge treatment effects uh, the, the, across the different cover crops and the annual systems we do see some some uh, uh, separation here in the cereal rye versus the alfalfa removed and the alfalfa and that that could uh, be uh, attributed to the higher amounts of, of residual nitrogen coming from those two uh, treatments but but by and large, I, I, I just want it, anything below 400 is really good weed control, so. Now looking at uh, corn yields, uh, Bill, you're, you're certainly doing a fabulous job out there, but uh, we do need to highlight the difference. This is an irrigated-based system, and these guys are not irrigated, so you can see that some of the striking uh, differences between uh, what, what that season looked like. It was a really dry cropping uh, year and, and so uh, a lot of impact on performance across the board. Let's break these down one at a time, uh, but, but that's the, the striking difference you're seeing here is, is largely from an irrigated system to a non-irrigated system. So now let's look at uh, just these one at a time. In, at Mason Heritage Farm, these black lines represent the uh, no poultry litter. So that's just the, the effects of the cover crop. And we do see some yield uh, uh, improvement, a, a minor yield improvement from the presence of the cover crop. Uh, but by and large, with the additions of, of poultry litter, we see no uh, difference in whether it was side dressed or applied pre-plant or at the phosphorus level. And so that was really encouraging uh, that, that the phosphorus-based uh, uh, rates uh, pr uh, produced comparable yields to the N-based or the side dress with the phosphorus-based. Here, when we look at the cut fresh organics, we see even a bigger effect of, of cover crops. So the two cover crops here had, had a larger impact on the overall perfor yield performance. Uh, uh, but then again, as well, when you have poultry litter in the mix, uh, there's really uh, uh, no effect uh, difference between the end base rates. So one and a half ton versus three ton, no difference in yield performance at, at, in a non-irrigated system. So, so he's hit his yield potential and, oh, I, and I didn't mention this earlier on, it's up at the top, you can see, these are, the, these are weed free plots. So we have both weed free and, and weedy data. I just wanted to focus in on the, the nitrogen response today. So here you're just looking at the weed free plots. And so these values here represent the yield potential in those systems. And so here you can see uh, in the cut fresh organics, uh, regardless of, of the rate of the poultry litter that it had, uh, it, it had a, a pretty uh, common uh, uh, yield. And then lastly, in the alfalfa-based systems, what we think is going on there is, is that there's just so much residual nitrogen in, in that extensive root system coming from the alfalfa that regardless of whether or not you have the alfalfa removed in the spring or that you use that chopped uh, uh, forage in the spring for, as a, a cover crop, as a green manure, or whether uh, you killed it in the uh, fall, they pretty much behaved pretty comparably. Uh, there's, a, there's enough of a range in the, in the data and so that those yields are pretty much comparable uh, across the board. And, and so there, the alfalfa playing a big role in the uh, fertility of the corn crop. So I just wanted to reiterate, this is just the first year's findings, uh, really just scratching on the surface. We had a, a really dry year, and so that gives you some indications of what can go on in a, a dry year. Uh, but uh, really, this is just a one year's findings, and so uh, we look forward to uh, sharing more of this data with you as uh, time comes by. Uh, here we saw that moderate to high yields increased with cover crops, so an important role it plays in the system. Uh, Long-term organic management builds base mineral nitrogen. I think that's the take-home, one of the big take-home messages today, that, that these organic systems that we were looking at, particularly, for example, uh, what we saw with uh, uh, at Bill's site where there wasn't a huge response uh, to the cover crops, uh, that, that he's been building up that, that soil organic matter and, and building up that base fertility and, and mineralization rates over time. 
Uh, there really wasn't a clear advantage to side dress, but uh, what, what side dress does give you is an opportunity uh, to uh, have more informed decision making. And so if it's going to be a wet year and you have the kinds of soil moisture levels there, then uh, that, that may influence your decisions on how much uh, poultry litter you put down. Clearly, there was no difference in an N-based or a P-based or side dress in, in the non-irrigated uh, system, uh, but th this at least gives you uh, potentially some flexibility in management decisions. And then I think the, the, the other big take-home message is that P-based poultry litter applications were adequate, and so that, that you had, it reached its yield potential uh, uh, comparable to the end base rates. With that, I wanted to uh, thank many of the participants. This is by no means a, a laundry list. There's a lot more folks that, that should be on that list uh, uh, that helped at the Bark site. Uh, so these are just a few names uh, to mention. Uh, uh, but we have a, a really a substantial crew that comes out and is helping frequently throughout the uh, season to accomplish these goals. And it's a big haul getting up uh, uh, fairly early driving out to the eastern shore, sometimes two, three hours out to these different sites to work with the growers. And, and so certainly want to thank all of those folks. Um, uh, Jenny Rhodes, Terry Poole, John Hall, other folks that have participated and been involved in, in forming uh, some of the work that we're doing here, and, and uh, Karen Fetter. And then I also wanted to uh, mention that we have been doing uh, outreach events on some of the growers' uh, sites as well as on Bark throughout the years, and we'll continue to. So uh, stay tuned for that and also put a plug in for uh, eOrganic. Uh, as Michelle mentioned earlier, we are doing uh, a fair amount of work with eOrganic. Betty is leading uh, the team's effort in that regard, and um, part of the, the funding that we received for this project is funding our investment into uh, putting content up on eOrganic, and so we're getting more and more trained on how to do that, and you'll start to see more and more content coming from uh, our, our folks on the uh, grains component of that site. So with that, I open it up to questions. Michelle, Michelle you want to join me up here? You know, I have to go back and look. I don't remember what was the year comparison between the two. Um, the question was, uh, what are the differences in uh, timeline of organic management between the two sites, uh, between the three sites of farms? And I, I know that the site that we were working with Aaron on, that was two, two years transitioned. And um, the, uh, let me. Bill, how you've been in 2005, right? So that's so seven years on the sites that we were looking at. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Do you remember what Ed's was, Michelle? Yeah, Ed, I think Ed, Ed's been farming organically longer than than you, Bill, right? And that I assume I think that field has been part of his organic rotation for quite a while. I'm not sure, but it was coming out of yeah, alfalfa after four years, so it also had that. 